Hello, welcome back. Now that we are familiar with the types of connectivity, let's see how they can be included in a zonation analysis. Zonation is a very flexible software in relation to connectivity parameterization. There are several alternative ways to include connectivity into a prioritization. If that is considered essential, of course, which usually is the case. Zonation's optional connectivity parameters differ greatly from each other. Some of them are structural and others target functional connectivity. There are feature-specific connectivity calculations and those that target the landscape as a whole. Let's get going. Back to zonation. How does it deal with the intricate phenomenon of connectivity? Zonation offers several options for analytical connectivity designs and considerations, albeit zonation is not a software intended for connectivity analysis. Let's have a quick overlook on zonation's connectivity parameters. First, we have very simple qualitative or structural ways to include connectivity into a prioritization. These include edge removal, which I explained in more detail in the first part of lecture three. Boundary length penalty is another structural connectivity parameter, and I will demonstrate how it works soon. Next, there are three feature specific ways to approach connectivity. These include distribution smoothing that I introduced in the previous video. But there is also the possibility to include a boundary quality penalty for a specific feature layer and to define directed or directional connectivity. We will get back to these later today. Interaction connectivity means that some feature layers within the prioritization are functionally connected. If there are two interacting layers, this one-to-one -one connectedness is defined by including a pairwise interaction connectivity design in the analysis. If more than two feature layers are contributing to each other, we need to include a matrix connectivity design. Then, if connectivity occurs in the form of linear landscape elements, that is some form of corridors, zonation can apply a path-like connectivity design as well. Finally, it is always possible to add spatial data on connectivity as a feature layer. So, in zonation prioritizations, connectivity is added as an optional input parameter, and there are several alternatives to choose from. It is always advisable to first run the analysis without any connectivity parameters, then add one type of connectivity and compare the results from the two runs. Despite the many options available, only one type of computational connectivity should be used in an analysis, because otherwise the analysis is not explainable and interpretable. The results may become extremely difficult to interpret. One more elaborate connectivity measure, for example distribution smoothing, can be combined with a simple structural method such as edge removal, but that's about it if one wishes to keep the results easily interpretable. Then, if the used data resolution is high, meaning that the raster cells are small in size, connectivity parameters should be included in any zonation analysis due to ecological reasons. If the raster cells are small enough that they do not contain whole populations of species, the population dynamics of nearby cells are strongly linked, and this definitely needs to be accounted for in the analysis. With coarse resolution cells, meaning a roughly a cell size of tens of hectares, connectivity parameters can be omitted, at least in theory. This, however, is a rare case as nowadays spatial data come in increasingly fine resolution and researchers often wish to use the most accurate data available. 
the way connectivity is treated in any zonation analysis is an important part of the defined model of conservation value. This applies also to prioritizations where connectivity is not taken into account. Let's now start examining the different connectivity options available in more detail. Let's jump into the boundary length penalty as edge removal was already familiar to us. The boundary length penalty has been by far the most common way of adding aggregation to a reserve network in the history of spatial conservation prioritization. The measure is relatively simple. It is calculated by dividing the length of the outer boundary of the patch by the area of the patch. The area in this simple example equals the number of cells in the patch, which is 9. The boundary or edge length is 12. The boundary length penalty does not include any feature-specific components. It is a poorly structural measure of connectivity and it is based just on patch area and edge length. The boundary length penalty contributes to the conservation value of a location by reducing the value in cases where the patch has gotten smaller and thus has longer boundaries in relation to its area. In the formula for actual cell value calculation, the beta value defines the strength of the boundary length penalty. The beta can be used to adjust the strength of the effect of boundary length penalty. Okay, if we were to remove one cell of this landscape or batch, which of the two alternatives would it be? Let's give boundary length penalty a try. We can now forget the actual cell values for a while. Let's assume that all orange cells have the same value. The question is, how strong is the boundary length penalty in each of the alternative case and how do they compare to the original situation? Note that only the outer boundary that surrounds the cells is included in the calculation. The boundary length penalty of the intact patch is 12 units divided by 9 units. That gives us 1.33. Next, let's calculate the patch areas and boundary lengths of our alternatives. In both cases, the patch area is 8, but the second alternative has a longer boundary. As a result, the second alternative has higher boundary length penalty. Note that the calculation of the first alternative would be exactly the same if we were to remove any of the cells lying at the corners of the patch. The same is true for the second alternative. The cell to be removed could be any of those four cells located in the middle of the three unit edges. And actually, we are here applying the edge removal principle as well, as we are not considering of removing the cell that lies in the middle of the patch. All right, now we know which cell we are likely to remove, but how does the boundary length penalty affect the actual cell values? That is, how does it actually feed into the conservation value? Remember that zonation does the cell removal based on the least marginal loss of conservation value. The boundary length penalty only partially contributes to that information. Now we need to see how large is the change in boundary length penalty when compared to the intact patch. The delta value gives us that information. In the first alternative, the change in boundary length penalty is 0.25 units smaller compared to the second alternative. If the original cell values were the same throughout the patch, as is here in our simplified example, the smaller change means we are indeed removing the corner cell. Let's assume that the original cell values were 1. In both alternative cell removal cases, we lose conservation value, but how much? The effect of boundary length penalty is scaled by the beta value, which is a constant defined in the analysis parameters. For this example, let's use a beta value of 1. 
This means we don't need to take beta into account in calculating the resulting cell values. We can just extract the delta value from the original value of 1. The actual cell values show how the loss in conservation value in the first alternative is much smaller than in the second alternative. The fact that the beta is constant means that the effect of boundary length penalty is the same for all cells. Thus, the actual conservation value of each cell is driven by the information in the original biodiversity features when compared to the boundary length penalty. This can of course be changed by using a very high beta values, but that would not be ecologically feasible. The sensible range of beta is found only by experimentation. Of course, if we had differences in the original cell values, also the resulting values would not be uniform. Note also two another simplifications. This calculation example left the normalization and value aggregation phases out. This means that we did not relate the cell values to the overall conservation value within the landscape, nor did we specify which cell removal rule to use. So to recap how zonation does the calculations, it starts with the original or absolute cell values of all feature layers present, divides each absolute value by the total sum for that feature over the landscape or patch in this example. Then it calculates the aggregated conservation value over all features and for each cell according to the used cell removal rule. Then zonation calculates how this aggregated conservation value in each cell would change due to boundary length penalties according to alternative removal locations. After that, it searches for the smallest loss in conservation value and removes that cell. After the removal, the cycle starts again with absolute cell values. So the actual computations here are far more complex than what is exemplified here. In this case, it is only the smallest change in the boundary length penalty that is searched for, and here the delta value determines which cell will be removed. So yes, the second alternative is our choice. And the basic working principle of boundary length penalty is nevertheless quite straightforward. Overall, the use of boundary length penalty reduces the edge to area ratio of remaining areas. Boundary length penalty is a poorly structural method that treats the landscape as a whole. Thus, it does not take individual features into account. It defines boundaries from feature aggregations that are translated into patches. Boundary length penalty has been a commonly used method in reserve selection, and for many older prioritizations, it was the only available method to add aggregation into the solution. Also, modern prioritizations typically include boundary length penalty by default. In any case, it should be clear for the user how the boundary length penalty actually works. Distribution smoothing is a more elaborate method to account for connectivity, as we learned during part one of this lecture. Distribution smoothing is based on a connectivity surface computed from the original data feature distributions. The calculations are done for each feature layer separately. As a result, distribution smoothing identifies areas that have on average high occupancy levels for features. The calculation follows the principles of functional connectivity on habitat level that is based on metapopulation dynamics. This means that the value of connectivity for a given location is directly proportional to the number of expected immigrating individuals to that location. Here in the left bottom graph, the individuals of the isolated cell disperse to other cells no immigration happens to that cell. Thus, this cell right here is a so-called sink location. Its immigration level is higher than its immigration level. 
the opposite is true for the middle cell in the aggregation of three adjacent cells. In that cell, the immigration is higher when compared to emigration. Distribution smoothing runs calculations that quantify these differences and make them visible in the data. In addition, distribution smoothing allows for the dispersal to spread into matrix and it enables the level of dispersal to decline by distance. In other words, the occurrences of original data become spread out due to smoothing and the smooth values get smaller when located more far away from the original occurrence. As you hopefully remember from the previous video, the alpha value is the feature-specific parameter of the dispersal kernel. The alpha defines the width of the smoothing kernel. It can be translated as a radiation distance of a kind. When we compare the equations for distribution smoothing and metapopulation connectivity to each other, we see that they are very similar. This is because distribution smoothing effectively is a metapopulation connectivity calculation, which transforms a map of habitat quality to a spatial connectivity distribution. This makes distribution smoothing an ecologically sound connectivity design in zones, and it is very popular. The smoothing very effectively identifies important semi-continuous regions where the feature has overall high levels of occurrence although not necessarily in every grid cell. However, there is a but. As a result, relatively scattered occurrences lose value. This means that distribution smoothing emphasizes continuous or nearly continuous feature distributions. The same is true for boundary length penalty. Thus, both distribution smoothing and boundary length penalty perform poorly for species that happily live in fragmented habitats or isolated patches. And there are such species too. Boundary quality penalty, on the other hand, is an ecologically sound option that suits also the case for those species that thrive in fragmented landscapes. Boundary quality penalty can be seen as a way to approximate non-linear effects of connectivity that may be present in species distribution models. These include, for example, neighborhood effects and thresholds. This method also describes the aggregate response of a feature to habitat loss and fragmentation. The boundary quality penalty has two key components through which it predicts an abundance or a probability of occurrence for a feature in every cell of the analyzed landscape. Firstly, it needs a value for the radius of a feature-specific buffer that determines the spatial extent of connectivity effect. And secondly, a loss function has to be defined in order to describe the type of the feature-specific response curve for habitat loss or location removal. When calculating boundary quality penalty, loss of a cell influences not only the focal cell, but also values within neighboring cells. Note that here, as in many other cases throughout the lectures of this course, the words feature and species are used quite interchangeably when speaking about data inputs for zonation analysis. In this case, the assumption is that the boundary quality penalty is calculated for data featuring species occurrence and distribution information. Boundary quality penalty is explained in more detail in the zonation user manual and by Moilanen and colleagues 2009. Directional or directed connectivity then is a specific method to calculate connectivity for cases where location determines the connectedness and connectivity is translated into movement or flow in between the locations, that is spatial direction is of essence. Specifically, this becomes handy when dealing with flowing river ecosystems. 
the linkages between locations can correspond to hydrological flows or other connecting landscape elements, such as hedgerows or spatially discontinuous but functionally linked planning units, such as resting areas on migration routes of migratory species. Directional connectivity is a generalization of the boundary quality penalty technique in which the concept of neighborhood is generalized. Basically meaning that it is not calculated for cells using a radius of effect, but it is calculated for larger functional entities. These entities are called planning units. This means that directional connectivity does not focus on raster cells, but predefined functional entities consisting of several cells like this. Here we see how a rather linear feature is divided into three functional units. Now, instead of using a circular neighborhood definition, the directional connectivity is defined using a three hierarchy of linked planning units. A focal area, that is the yellow planning unit in the middle, is influenced by some action potentially both downstream and upstream from the focal location. The default is that this action is habitat loss due to location removal and thus the neighborhood effect is negative for the focal planning unit. Because of this way of treating location neighborhoods, directional connectivity is also called as neighborhood quality penalty. The impact of removal of a upstream location can be scaled differently when compared to the impact of a downstream location removal. The parameterization of the neighborhood impacts follow from the ecological requirements of the feature in question. And note, the usage of planning units is common in zonation analysis also beyond directional connectivity designs. Oftentimes, the whole prioritization is run by removing planning units instead of individual cells. It has certain benefits. Next, let's tackle interaction connectivity. Now we enter into a realm where connectivity is defined among different features, whereas the earlier approaches were either feature-specific or did not target specific features at all. Now we have two features. So interaction connectivity is based on ecological interactions among two biodiversity features. It means connectivity contribution of one feature to another, for example, connectedness of two habitat types that share overlapping but not identical species communities. The connectivity calculation uses distribution smoothing. Thus, the density of one feature in the landscape benefits the other feature in nearby locations. When one feature feeds positively into another, it can be seen as a resource or other important factor contributing to the quality of locations of the other feature. Here we see how the blue feature contributes to the red feature. The effect declines by distance and the spatial scale of impact is taken into account by using the negative exponential dispersal kernel. Interaction connectivity is calculated based on the so-called resource feature, but it targets the focal feature, which in this case is the consumer of that resource. In this example, interaction connectivity is considered to be positive. Here, the proximity of two feature distributions is beneficial for ecological reasons, and a true positive linkage is assumed between the two. Inclusion of a positive interaction connectivity is suitable in many cases, also other than a resource and consumer case presented here. Examples of these include connectivity between a breeding habitat and a feeding habitat, or a temporal connectivity between past and present habitat distribution, or present and modeled future habitat distribution. In addition, interaction connectivity can be used in planning expansion of a protected area network. In that case, 
a positive interaction between existing protected areas and potential new protected areas can be included in the analysis, which increases the spatial connectedness of the final protected area network in a desired way. Interaction connectivity can also be reversed if there is a reason to avoid the proximity of two features in the prioritization solution. Negative or inverse interaction connectivity can be understood as spatial buffering of one feature from another. For example, protected areas could be buffered against pollution sources, or populations of an endangered species could be buffered against another species that shares the same resources and is a stronger competitor. Even more elaborate ways to take connectivity into account are available in zonation. Matrix connectivity is an extension of interaction connectivity. Here, connectivity among multiple features is defined through a feature-by-feature -feature similarity matrix. Matrix connectivity is useful when analysis includes habitats that share many species and thus contribute to each other's connectivity. The matrix defines pairwise interactions between the biodiversity features being analogous to a correlation matrix. In addition, feature-specific dispersal kernels are defined. Finally, corridor connectivity aims to retain linear feature distributions during the prioritization. The corridor building method implemented in zonation is called corridor loss penalty. It maintains connections guided by feature-specific spatial patterns. Corridor loss penalty extends the boundary length penalty and prevents loss of structural connections in networks of patches. There are two key parameters in corridor connectivity that need to be adjusted. Firstly, there is the penalty strength that regulates the trade-off between increased connectivity and conservation value lost due to implementation of corridor building. Secondly, a minimum width of corridors is defined. Connections narrower than this parameter are not considered as corridors. Generally speaking, corridor building is a tricky analysis to do, and it comes with many challenges. For example, what is the best way to build corridors in irregular networks made of large number of patches of diverse spatial morphology? Or how does one determine an appropriate corridor width and account for the diverse requirements of many species and other relevant factors simultaneously. And then where in the landscape corridors should be generated? There are no known best settings for corridor connectivity designs, and the effects of different parameters are case specific. As with any spatial priority ranking, careful interpretation of results is required. Okay, that was quite a handful, but we are not satisfied yet, right? Connectivity considerations are important, but what actually happens when we include connectivity into a zonation analysis? Connectivity calculations and designs are one part of the model of conservation value which lies at the heart of zonation prioritization. The computational analysis needs well-defined inputs that are constructed according to the model of conservation value in order to produce a feasible and well-reasoned output. Basically, the inputs are structured as follows. First, we have the data features. The values within features are multiplied by weights given to each of them. Then, we can add feature-specific connectivity calculations. We can include information on habitat quality. In zonation terms, we call this condition. The numerical information on condition is a multiplier in calculating conservation value, as you perhaps remember from our first online demonstration. Then we can include cost calculations, which divide the conservation value per unit of area or resource. Also, other relevant constraints for the prioritization should be taken into account. 
all this information is condensed by the analysis and implemented into the priority ranking based on the chosen cell or location removal rule. Together, all this parameterization forms the structure of the analysis and in practice it takes place in the settings definition of the prioritization analysis. Again, I cannot emphasize enough how much subjective choices one must do when constructing the analysis. One way to treat this subjectivity is collaboration. Selection and definition of each parameter is best done by a group of experts with throughout discussion and evaluation of the analysis output and prioritization results. What then should be discussed? Well, concerning connectivity, a good starting point is to remember the following presumptions and be wary of them. Are we presuming that vegetation type can be used as a proxy for habitat availability for one or many species? Are we assuming that a structural connectivity measured on the basis of land cover types is a reasonable proxy for functional connectivity of multiple species? Are we assuming that protecting locations with the most populations of a species maximizes the chances of persistence in both the short and long term survival? These presumptions underlie the chosen model of conservation value. We often end up mixing habitat connectivity and landscape connectivity or equal them with each other when doing spatial prioritizations. If we are to equal habitat connectivity and landscape connectivity, the decision should be clearly stated and reasoned. We also often end up mixing spatial distribution and continuity of populations on the basis of assumed spatiotemporal connectivity. This is an extremely dangerous presumption in the context of climate change, increasing land use pressures, social conflicts and frequent unexpected ecological disturbances. Welcome to real world. Okay, how does connectivity change zonation outputs? First, we need the reference point. You have already seen these figures in an earlier lecture. Here we have a zonation output from an analysis that was run without any connectivity considerations. A freely running zonation iteratively removes the locations or cells with least conservation value calculated on the basis of input features. The most valuable locations are retained the longest and thus given the highest rank. On the map, the locations of the high rank cells or the top fraction of the prioritization are determined by the feature attributes and distributions, not by spatial aggregation. In the graph, the performance curves show how the analysis tries to retain the maximum representation of all four features as long as possible. Then, when connectivity is included, both outputs change. The first change is observed in the rank priority map. Addition of a connectivity parameter increases the spatial aggregation of top priority areas. It seems nice to the eye, but it is actually a restriction for the analysis. When connectivity is included, meaning that we force spatial aggregation into the prioritization, the performance curves go down. This means that there is a trade-off between increasing spatial aggregation and the retained representation of individual features along the proceeding of the analysis. Including connectivity in the prioritization means that we lose conservation value more quickly. Now zonation cannot retain isolated locations that are valuable in terms of biodiversity features. If a feature has a fragmented distribution, it suffers from the connectivity parameterization. This is shown by the poor performance of the purple feature, feature number four. Connectivity parameters significantly affect the way zonation calculates the conservation value for the locations. Therefore, choosing to include connectivity into the prioritization and the way connectivity is taken into account are not trivial choices.
when you read research articles or reports on zonation analysis or any other spatial prioritization, pay attention to how connectivity is defined and treated in the analysis if it is taken into account at all. Also, be sure to clearly define how you conceptualize and treat connectivity in your own work.